Hi, and welcome to this lecture on lesson planning. So before this lecture, you've been watching a whole heap of mini lecturettes, segments on cognitive verbs, segments on assessment, on collaborative learning strategies, and the purpose of this particular lecture is to bring it all together. So rather than being inundated with a whole heap of different concepts in this week, those concepts have been dealt with earlier to give your uh, brain time to process and really internalize that knowledge. And this particular lecture is focused on bringing it all together because the purpose of doing those mini lecturettes is really building up to this really, really important activity that you'll be doing of lesson planning. So, mm -mm -mm. so the learning objective for today are those that you can see on the board. You should be able to, after this lecture, you should be able to look at any lesson plan and be able to, to not only identify but justify why that particular element is there. You should be able to construct good learning objectives using cognitive verbs and related very much to those are the success criteria. Um, and we're going to have a look at a particular type of success criteria, a very formative approach to success criteria, where we're actually going to differentiate that particular element. Um, and as I was saying earlier, this is the, the, the entire goal of this is to actually uh, plan an entire lesson. Okay? Radio. So if there's one thing that you're going to take away from the lecture today, it should be this, that failing to plan is planning to fail. Okay? Just hoping that your lesson is going to go well is not a method of planning. Now, when you go out on practicum and eventually when you start teaching in your first one or two years, this planning on paper is absolutely critical. Um, and, and, so, and, and critical because there are really good theoretical reasons for, for doing it, but also it helps clarify in your mind what the purpose of the lesson is. It's able to keep you on track while you're teaching. So, one of the, the key major goals for today is being able to produce a page like this. Now, in a lot of education Queensland schools, it's actually mandatory to include learning objectives or WALTs, we are learning to. They, they mean the same thing. In a smaller subset of schools, all teachers within those schools are required to present success criteria or WILFs, what I'm looking for is, and in a smaller subset of schools is, uh, is this strategy of providing the reason. Why, why are we learning about Pythagoras' theorem? Why are we learning about the states of matter? Well, um, that, that's where the TIBs come in. This is because it's giving the students that reason. So it's really um, cutting off at the pass those, those questions that students ask of, when am I ever going to use this? Okay, well, you, we're, we're doing this lecture so you can actually construct uh, good lesson plans. Okay, so... Let's have a look at the parts of the lesson plans and why are they there. Now before we go on, um, just a general note about lesson plans is that the lesson planning that we get you to do in your, um, in, in your university courses are very much something that, that teachers will do automatically and will just store in their heads. Okay? So what we're doing is getting you to concrete, uh, sorry, to plan concretely to put your planning down on paper. So number one, we can actually check that all the elements are actually there. You're thinking through all of the necessary elements for a good lesson. But also so that a mentor, somebody else can actually check um, that you've actually got everything and that you're not missing key elements. And it's also able to keep you on track, okay? Now, the, so when you go out on track, if you ask your mentor, oh, can I have a look at your lesson plans? More than likely, they, they are going to say, oh, I don't lesson plan anymore. Well, they actually do, but they don't do the on-paper lesson planning that you're doing at the moment. Yeah? So while you're still a beginner, while you're still a novice at teaching, we get you to do things quite explicitly, physically, concretely, so that we can actually see it and check it. And naturally, over time, what you'll do, what you'll find, is that you'll just put less and less detail into your lesson plans until eventually, one day, all your lesson will be, maybe your learning objective in your day planner uh, as a teacher, and then maybe some reminders of that you need to get, I don't know, equipment for a demonstration or something like that, okay? So what we're doing is we're moving you along the continuum 
from being a novice teacher who has to lesson plan physically on paper to a more experienced teacher who's able to still lesson plan but keep the majority of that, that information in your head and only the absolute key information gets written down on paper. Okay? Now, one of the, a, a good text and a, and a good principle in terms of lesson planning is I, this idea of understanding by design or backwards, dis, backward mapping or backward design. Now, understanding by design is, is the title of the book that I'm going to recommend that you read if you want to read more on lesson planning. It's by Wiggins and McTie, and essentially it's, it's um, just put into book form what good planners have been doing all the time. It's thinking about what is your final goal, what product do you want students to, to uh, have produced by the end, what is the learning outcome at the end of this lesson, and then once you know that goal, planning backwards from there. Okay? So understanding by design is really um, the, the, the concept of that you're actually helping students understand the material on purpose, by design. Okay? Um, and this is the approach that we recommend that when you plan lessons or plan units, you actually think about, right here, what is the goal? What, what thing do I want students to know? What do I want them to do? What product do I want them to produce? So there's three ideas that you can set as goals and then backward map from there. Okay? So there are pretty much four easy steps when you are lesson planning. Number one, identify the desired result. That is the final goal. And then we backwards map from there. Once you've done that, you determine your assessment evidence. That's what the success criteria are. When you look for evidence of learning, what are you actually looking for? So success criteria, assessment evidence, wealth, they are interchangeable ideas and terms that we're going to be using in this lecture. Once you've done that, then go ahead and select the lesson structure. So that will vary depending on whether you are teaching a content lesson or a practical lesson. And then the last step is to then go ahead and plan the activities. Okay? Um, and then, so, and so you make sure that when you're planning the activities that the students are learning actively, they are the ones doing the information gathering, information sorting, and information connecting. That is the whole process of learning. That you've got questions in there to scaffold thinking, and that you state what you're doing and what students are doing. So, though, so those, those last two in particular uh, need to be explicitly stated in, a, in any lesson plan. Okay? Radio. So, step number one, identifying the desired result. Now, it, it's, depending upon which school you go to, whether you're in primary school or high school, they either call them learning objectives or learning intents. I prefer to call, call them WALTs because that STEM, we are learning too, is actually helpful in writing the rest of that sentence. Essentially what you're doing is it's making a statement about what you want students to be able to know, feel or do. Now more technically, that's talking about um, how do you want to develop students' brains in the affective, cognitive and behavioural domains. So cognitive is the content, attitudes and feelings is, are the affective and skills are, are the behavioural components. So you can make your learning objective um, something that students know, feel or do. In junior secondary and pretty much into senior secondary, I only recommend that you will have one learning objective, absolutely important. Now contrast that with the lectures that you're watching where there are a million learning objectives. So the reason why you have so many learning objectives is because on that continuum from novice learner to expert learner, you are much further down that track than say a 12 or 13 year old kid. So because you are further more towards the expert side, you actually you get more because you can learn faster, we can cover more concepts. Okay? And, the, and the other thing is, is that when you're writing them, you'll have a verb group and a noun group. The noun group must be based upon the Australian curriculum content descriptors. Now sometimes that's done for you by the teaching team before you've actually gotten to that school. Or if you're particularly unlucky and you end up at say out at Thagaminda and there are no resources and you're writing it from scratch, you are necessarily going to have to go back to the Australian curriculum and then come forward. Okay? So 
the learning objective always starts, always, always, always starts with a verb or a process, depending upon what type of grammar you learned, and then ends with a noun group. Now that noun group, it has something to do with the Australian Curriculum Content Descriptor. Okay? Now, here are some examples here. Okay? So, identify and justify. Now, what I've, what I've done in all these uh, lecture PowerPoints is I've highlighted in red the verb, just so that you can see them. They're always at the start, yeah, and they'll always be in red. So they are the verb element followed by the noun element. Now, so there are three learning objectives all related to this particular lecture. Then this is the success criteria. So I want you to be able to do that. And here's the reason here, okay? So that's hopefully you can, if you pause this, have a think about how the learning objectives relate to the success criteria and then uh, relate to the reason for learning. Now, the verbs that I recommend that you use, you can see on the board here, okay? Now, these are organized according to Bloom's taxonomy, remembering all the way up to creating. Um, now, there is this document here. If you haven't already done so, please do go download a copy to your hard drive and use that as your Bible for creating your, uh, your waltz and your learning objectives, okay? So here are the a variety of um, cognitive verbs. What I've done is I've sorted those into the Bloom's level. Now, what you'll find is, in, you'll find this in policy documents, you'll find it in QCAA documents, you'll find that even your mentor may use the word understand. I highly, highly do not recommend that you use understand as your cognitive verb. A better idea is to think can this learning objective stand alone as an exam question, okay? So once you've written it, ask yourself, can it stand alone as an exam question? If the answer is no, then I recommend that you change it. So this is where understand really doesn't fit that criteria because there's no, there will never be an exam question which states, um, understand the water cycle. Um, yeah, no. There will be explain the water cycle or identify the elements of the water cycle, or apply the water cycle to solve this particular problem, but there will never be an exam question which states, understand the water cycle. If you do use the word understand, have another think about what you really asking the student to do. Are you asking them explanation? Are you asking them to identify elements? Are you asking them to sort elements and re rearrange elements? Think about, uh, think more carefully about the verb that you're actually using there, okay? So that is cognitive verbs and how they relate to waltz. So have a go yourself. Now, you may have a course where you're actually required to do some lesson planning. This is your opportunity here. And at some stage, <laughs> um, if you do lesson planning as part of your course, then bring that along to the relevant session so we can actually have a look at them. Okay? Step number two, once you know your end goal, what you want students to be able to do, you need to set the assessment evidence or the success criteria. Now, there are two acronyms that we'll have a look at to guide you in writing your success criteria. One of those is SMART. So when you're writing success criteria, the more specific, measurable, attainable and relevant, and then time bound they are, the more likely you are to actually hit that goal, or in this case, the success criteria. So I'm just gonna show you three examples here. Now, these all start with by the end of the lesson. Now, if these are a wilf of part of the lesson, that by the end of the lesson is kind of assumed, unless it's like a, a double lesson thing that you're doing, okay? So in practice, you can probably get rid of that by the end of the lesson. Now, where what you will notice is the use of the personal pronoun you. Now that's really important because it's actually by d addressing the student directly, it's really signaling them and signaling to them that this is meant for them, okay? Now this is an important um, idea in success criteria because the whole point of the success criteria is not for really for you as a teacher to judge whether the student has met the, um, the, the success level the, for the lesson, but really it's for introspection. It's helping students develop that personal and that personal capability um, that we spoke about in the general capabilities lesson. So it's a tool 
a formative learning tool that we give to students so as they're working they're able to check their progress as they're going along and self-correct if needed. Okay? What you'll notice also in these uh, success criteria is that they're measurable. Now a lot of times you can actually quantify things and we'll talk about how you determine whether it's five sentence paragraph, ten principles or ten correctly answered questions. Okay, Excellent. So let's move on. Now these are some ineffective success criteria. So for example, uh, what I'm looking for is you will understand the water cycle. Well, how do you want me to demonstrate understanding? Do you want me to write a paragraph? Do you want me to draw it? Do you want me to do an interpretive dance of the water cycle? Be more specific. Now, what output do you want students to demonstrate understanding? Same thing here. Can you be more specific in terms of, well, what do you want me to multiply? Two single digit numbers, um, a double digit and a triple digit. Do you want me to multiply fractions with a whole number or two fractions together? So the more, the more specific you can be, the better. And so this one as well. You will know about solids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, what do you want me to know? Um, do you want me to recall information? Do you want me to identify solids in the real world? Do you want me to explain solids using the particle model? The more specific you can be, the easier it is for your students to be able to demonstrate success. Okay? Excellent. Rodeo, there's another acronym that you can use to guide you. And what I like about this one is this last point here about it being kids speak. Now, a lot of what we're actually teaching in this course is leading you to a place of being student-centered. Okay? Now, the success criteria, good success criteria, are written for the student to be read by the student from the student's perspective. Okay? So, over here, you can see that the I, I write about the characters. Super, super important because once again, it's placing the, it's signaling quite clearly that this is intended for the student to be read by the student. Okay? So using I or we places the students at the center of this particular tool. What I also like about this notion of kids speak is that a lot of times as teachers, we use lots of um, edu babble, a lot of jargon that we understand as professionals in this area, but to a 12 or 13 year old kid, it just goes straight over their head. So for example, in English, we talk about literary elements. Literary elements this, literary elements that. What are the elements that you're talking about? Well, I'm talking about characters, plot, themes, and metaphors of the story. And if they are the elements that you're talking about, well, then just say it, okay? Just write it so the kids know, oh, that's what man means when she's talking about literary elements. Because there are many others, but you may be only focusing on a number of them, as is the example here. Okay? So instead of literary elements, flesh it out. Tell me what elements do you want? Same thing with narrative. Now narrative is quite, a, you could write a whole book on the definition of narrative, but in this case, it's the story that we're reading. Okay? What you'll also notice here is that we've actually defined the amount of product that we want. So we, it's not just deconstructs, but Something has to be written, I write about blah, 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 and the quantity which is required are the two paragraphs here. Okay? So this is a great example of making think kids speak. And so, so if, you're, if you're required to write success criteria for your lesson plan, put yourself in the, um, the, the place of the student and think from that perspective. That's really going to guide you in that endeavour. <coughs> Pardon me. Okay. So here's an example of where we have the WALT, the learning objective. So multiplication, quite specifically about two two-digit numbers using specificity again, using the me vertical method and also more specifics about how I would like the work to look is the set out um, uh, 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 work neatly. Okay? Because there are a whole range of conventions when you're writing mathematics and doing mathematics. Okay? So then you can see the success criteria is, um, so 10 questions, they need to be checked using a calculator, and I've also provided more specification in terms of the kind of multiplication problems that I want you to be working on. Okay? So 
how do we determine that 10? Well, for your will statement, think about the average student in your class, okay? So given the students that you have, the subject that it is, the day that you're teaching on, the weather, the time, the temperature, a whole range of different factors will really come into play when you're considering, radio. how much output do I want by the end of this lesson? So for example, you might be, uh, you don't have a lot of time at the end of the lesson, so instead of 10, you may only expect, say, six problems. Well, then you just change it to six. And this is the real beauty of formative assessment, because really, remember formative assessment, type assessment that we do to guide performance and form and shape behavior during the learning episode, we can actually make those decisions um, by, by ourselves without any consulting any external parties. Okay? Excellent. So go ahead, use um, the SMART acronym or the SMIRC acronym, have a go at writing your will. Now this is going to be easier if you're actually doing a lesson plan for assessment, um, but if not, ha still have a go at writing one. Okay before you get on on prac. So there's, there's another example, okay? Right, now, once you've written your Walt and your Wilf, you have to decide on a lesson structure. Now, there are four main lesson structures that we use in science. There's also discussion, but they are used very, very rarely. The, the four that you see here are you, the ones that are used most often, okay? Now, the first two, actually, the POE and inquiry they are the ones that we do when we're doing practicals, okay? So, if you've got a demonstration, if you've got an experiment which is too dangerous or it's going to be too expensive because you can't go to the moon, you can't fly to Mars, um, if it, the equipment is too expensive or too dangerous, then a, a good way to actually do it is you do it, but you demonstrate it to the students. Now, to help engage your students cognitively, and not just treat it like they're watching TV while you're doing the demonstration, then you would use a lesson structure such as the POE, predict, observe, explain. So that's where, as the name suggests, you have students make it, so you present the scenario. Generally, it's a discrepant event that will challenge student misconceptions about some idea. They make a prediction. So you present, sorry, so you present the scenario, then based upon your verbal explanation, students make a prediction of what's going to happen, then you perform the demonstration, the students call out their observations, and then from that, you as a teacher, you facilitate and you guide the explanation construction. Again, it's you being on the side, guiding the students as they're learning, puzzling through the concepts, connecting ideas, okay? If you have a longer practical, then you might use a method such as inquiry. So there's a number of methods out there. The five E's is a, is an inquiry method, which we use in science. Hollier's method is a, is a method which uh, is used in mathematics, okay? So key authors there are Bybee et al. He's the one that came up, him and his team are the ones that came up with five E's, okay? If you don't have time for the coverage of content, then go ahead and lecture your students, okay? But only if you don't have time. What's a much, much more effective method for teaching is explicit instruction. That's where we actually have a piece of content in mind, but we're actually teaching a thinking skill, and that's what we explicitly teach. So for example, you might want to compare and contrast dogs and cats. So the thinking tool there is a Venn diagram. So what we're explicitly teaching is the use of that Venn diagram using the content of dogs and cats, okay? so. Um, We'll go, that, we'll go into that more in that lesson on uh, explicit instruction, okay? So as a rough guide, because explicit instruction, this is gonna form a, a large part of your teaching methodology, okay? Now, another idea, um, a, a, another way of thinking about explicit instruction is this idea of gradual release, that over the course of the lesson, going from top to bottom in this case, at the very start of the lesson, it's very, the, the responsibility lies largely for, uh, um, uh, uh, in, in our court as teachers. So it might be a focused lesson, we're teaching very, very quickly a, a small segment, say for example on how to uh, factorise polynomials, for example, or how to balance equations. So we might role model, okay? So as we're doing a problem, we 
think out loud and we model the problem solving method on the board, thinking out loud. Then we repeat, so we do another example, but this time it's guided instruction. So where I might act as the scribe on the board, I'm actually calling on students to give me ideas on what should be uh, next. Okay? Then this is an innovation of the original method, which is I do, we do, you do, including this collaborative element, you do together. So before students work independently by themselves, there might be some pairs work or there might be some group work so students can continue helping each other before eventually students are working independently of not only of us but also other students so they can demonstrate that skill or knowledge of that particular concept, understanding of that particular concept independently because ultimately that's what we're working towards. Okay? Radio. Now, another key thing that you will need to do, but we've actually dealt with in another lecture, is where is uh, once you've got your learning objective, once you've got your success criteria and your lesson structure, is figuring out where am I going to go to for my text. Now, we've already spoken about text before, that text in the modern conception is really anything which conveys information. So this video is a text, my oral presentation is a text, a picture might be a text, a YouTube video, paragraphs in a textbook. There's a whole range of things which are now considered to be text. So there are traditional texts, but there are also modern multimodal texts. Okay? Now, a lot of times what you'll need to do is make sure that your cognitive verb matches the text. So a cognitive verb should match your thinking tool, and a thinking tool should match the text. Now, there's a whole range of different ways uh, of text that you can use, but this is the general structure on, on how um, I recommend that you, you think about your text. Okay? So first of all, identify the concept that you've got to teach. So whether it's chemistry, biology, physics, okay, that's the first thing that you've got to, got to figure out. Then you've got to figure out, okay, where, where am I going to go to? Am I going to have students read the textbook this lesson? Am I going to send them off to a website? Are we going to get a video? Are we going to watch a YouTube clip? Are we going to Skype a scientist? What text are we using to, to actually achieve and talk about, uh, sorry, to achieve that learning objective and also explore that concept in more detail? Once you've then determined that structure is then um, uh, the, the structure of the text that you've chosen, then you can actually select the corresponding graphic organizer. Now, I'm going to go through these very, very quickly, um, and just because we've already dealt with this before. Okay? Now, the reason why we actually are moving to this style of active learning, getting students to, to, to know how to compare and contrast, know how to analyze, know how to create uh, concept maps which demonstrate understanding, is because what we're really doing is moving students to become independent learners. So we're not going to be around with them, uh, uh, turning up to work, grabbing their, uh, their work manual, summarizing it into a PowerPoint and teaching the student. No, that's something the student has to do. Adults, functioning adults in, this, in Australia, need to be able to go out, find and locate texts and comprehend and interpret those so you can actually be a functioning adult. Okay? So the reason why we're actually taking this approach is because we're teaching learning skills. We're really teaching students how to learn. Okay? So when they get to university and get that ineffective lecturer, that's okay because they already know how to find content, summarize content, and learn it for themselves. Okay? So it's really a self-survival self um, thing that we're doing. Okay? So depending upon the text that you found, it will be written according to a particular structure. That particular structure has go-to tools. Okay? So a, a concept map is used if we determine a text being, to being list describe. If a text, if a piece of text is talking about a method or a series of events, then the go-to tool there would be a flow diagram. So cause and effect is a little bit fancier flow diagram, but essentially it's a flow diagram 
in this case going from one element to three effects. Or the go to tool, if, you're, if you are finding that you're reading about similarities and differences is the Venn diagram or the double bubble. And then the, the flow diagram makes another appearance if the text is really written according to problem solution. Okay? So there's a whole range of considerations that you need to take into account when determining that. Okay? Now, in terms of lesson planning structures, the, here's, a, here's a handy flow diagram to help you in that endeavor. So for example, there are basically two types of lessons that we teach. The ones over in blue are content lessons, the one in green are practical lessons. Okay? Now, notice that lecture is there, over there, um, on the far side of the screen. Notice that it's to be used sparingly and when you don't have a lot of time. When you do have time, that's when we go for active learning where we match cognitive verb, thinking tool and the text and as teachers we scaffold and facilitate students doing that skill of comparing and contrasting, of evaluating, of synthesis, of whatever cognitive verb that it is you've identified in your particular um, learning objective. Okay? Radio, let's switch to differentiation now because this is where we're going to start getting into how um, to differentiate your success criteria. One of the low hanging fruit in terms of differentiation. Now there is differentiation in terms of different uh, visual needs, auditory needs, cognitive capability, physical capability as well, but those areas are quite big and we actually have whole courses devoted to that kind of differentiation catering to special needs. The type of differentiation that we'll actually do here is very much more around the content and around the curriculum. Okay? So let's talk about differentiation. Now differentiation is, is, is where essentially where we modify our teaching methods to cater to differences within the student population. Now Historically, when it's come to uh, grouping students and catering our teaching to student ability and capability, what we've tended to do is stream students. Now, we tend to do this in mathematics where, say, in year eight, at the end of year eight, everybody gets a maths test. Based upon that maths test, the top 30, they go into the top class, the next 30 go into a middle class, the next 30, and so forth all the way down to the bottom to the bottom of the list where there's a, the, where there's a whole bunch of support students and the way the, what we do then is tailor our teaching to those particular cohorts of high middle and low now in theory that sounds like a great idea but decades of research has shown minimal effects on learning outcomes so the bright kids stay bright the middle kids stay in the middle and the support kids, well, they still need support after 12 years of learning. There's really no benefit to either of those three distinct populations when it comes to learning outcomes and there's also profound negative outcomes when it comes to equity. So there's a whole range of social issues which kick in. So for example, there's, there's, a, there's a real danger of the, uh, the, the, the dangers of labelling that uh, students who are generally put in the, um, the, the maths in the beer garden class um, generally will self-label and they will develop what's called a fixed mindset that, oh, I'm in the dummy class, I will never be good at maths, I've never been good at maths, there's no point in me trying. So there's that real danger of students becoming real fixed in that type of mindset where nothing they can do will actually change the situation in them coming better. Okay? So, differentiation in terms of streaming, that kind of streaming, not a good idea, not effective on, on any grounds. The other reason why we should differentiate and not stream is because this, this image here is the school improvement hierarchy. So, the education department, they've produced this as a guiding framework for schools who want to improve. Okay? So, well, you need a culture that that promotes learning. You need to have good data so that you can base 
decisions on so you can actually track improvement. Then you need these three elements. The systematic curriculum delivery, you know what you teach, how to teach it, but also you need good staff. And once those two levels of ideas are in place, then you can start thinking about differentiation, differentiating your teaching and learning. So the department recognises the importance of differentiated teaching and learning and have actually built their whole school improvement hierarchy around that notion. Okay? So, so no longer do we teach to the middle, no longer, um, sorry, no longer do we just teach to the middle and no longer do is, is there really room for the attitude and, and I've actually heard teachers express this idea of, oh, I'm just here to teach the smart kids and everybody else can just, um, just do whatever they want. Um, that's a horrible attitude and um, actually, yeah, it's, you, you're being negligent in your duties as a teacher because we're not just here to teach the top kids, we're not just here to teach the bottom kids, we are here to teach everybody. And what we're going to have a look at is going part of the way to actually do that from a curriculum perspective. Okay? So we can differentiate on the basis of curriculum, pedagogy and assessment. Now, what we're actually looking at here is differentiation in terms of pedagogy mainly. How we're going to teach. Because what we're going to do is we're going to differentiate that success criteria. Okay? Now, just a reminder of the different types of assessment. So there's diagnostic assessment, formative assessment, and summative assessment. Now, I've just pulled this image of the internet, but it's misleading in that, that items aren't defined by the type of thing, the tool that they are. So a th an assessment is diagnostic, formative, or summative based upon two ideas. Firstly, what is the purpose? If the purpose is to, to tailor and design future learning, then it's diagnostic assessment. If the assessment is designed to form and shape behaviour to guide performance, then it's formative. And if it is the, the purpose is to determine the sum total of knowledge of learning that's occurred at the end of a learning episode, then what you've got is summative. Okay? So depending on whether assessment is for learning, diagnostic, as learning, formative, or of learning, which is summative, that's what really defines whether something is diagnostic, formative, or summative. So tests, quizzes, um, questions, they're all really the same thing. Yeah? Um, but what matters is when it occurs. So you can use a test or a quiz, diagnostically, formatively or summatively. What you're required to do is justify when, by when it occurs, not what that, that uh, type of test is. Okay? Radio. So, in terms of differentiating your success criteria, first we need to discuss this idea of the zone of proximal development. Now, Lev Vygotsky is the guy behind this idea, a social constructivist from Russia, and his great innovation, his contribution to the field was that when it comes to learning, there is this zone of learning which is the absolute optimal. Okay? And the optimal zone of learning, when we as teachers pitch the material or the difficulty of the lesson just beyond what students are currently capable of doing. Okay? Now, when you look at any content area, any skill, playing the piano, um, swimming, walking, talking, teaching, um, recalling um, the, the times tables, recalling elements of the periodic table, we all exist somewhere on this continuum from novice all the way up to expert. Some of us are really good at riding a bike. Some of us are not so good at riding a bike. Some of us are really good at balancing equations. Some of us are not very good at balancing equations. So let's, for argument's sake, say we had the perfect instrument that was able to measure with absolute precision the number of elements in the periodic table that you can remember. So some people can remember a few, some people can remember 10, some people can remember 100, other people can barely name one. Okay? But if we got a bunch of people and we measured using this perfect tool how many elements of the periodic table can you remember, 
then what we roughly have is a distribution which looks like this. There's a bunch of people that, that kind of bunch up somehow. Yeah? So there's a bulge, and, and then that bulge kind of peters out on either side. Okay? So whether the bulge is up the expert tire end or down the novice end, there's going to be a bulge somewhere. Okay? Now, when it comes to determining where we're going to pitch for maximum bang for buck, it's a good idea to mentally split your class into three levels. Your support students down the end, your extension students up here, and the kids in the middle. Okay? So the kids in the middle are the bulk of the students in your class. Okay? The average student. So, when I said earlier that the idea of just teaching to the middle has been thrown out, it's a good starting point. And it's a good starting point because if you do teach to the middle, then you're going to hit the majority of students in your class. And that's a good thing. Yeah? So you might hit, I don't know, 80%, 85% of your students. Success. Yeah? So when you're writing your WILF, have in mind that average student. If, if that average student pushes themselves and I provide the necessary scaffolding, I'm going to pitch the material just beyond what they're currently capable. That's the two star. Okay? So when we write the criteria, that's what we're thinking. The two star is if the average student pushes themselves, uses the scaffolding that's provided, they should be able to achieve this. Notice how it's just beyond what they're capable of doing. Okay? So that's the middle level, the two star. What we then do is we think, okay, if a student just coasted, yeah, they didn't really push themselves, they just went through the motions of this lesson, what would they be able to achieve just by coasting? I set that as the one star. Okay? So we've got the one coasting students at that achievement level. Students who are pushing themselves can go for this level. And if a student is having a particular hot day, then they can be going for this big push here. Okay? So what we've got is a coast. Students coast is what you should be able to achieve. If you work hard, this is what you should be able to achieve. If you work really hard, this is what you should be able to achieve. Okay? So that is differentiated success criteria for the average student in your class. Okay? For a coast, a push, and a big push. So while that's good in terms of hitting 80%, 90% of the students in your class, you're missing 10%, 15% of your class who are at these other ends. So what we've got are these four students here who what is a push for everybody else, these students can already do. Yeah? And this student here, what is a really, really hard push for everybody else, he can already do. That's his coast or her coast. Yeah? So what you would do is you would have these extension students come to you and negotiate now the negotiate the success criteria. Now keep in mind that this is formative success criteria. This is just criteria that you're just using in the classroom. Okay? So that's why we can get away with it because it's not used for formal reporting. So that's the situation up at the extension end, similarly down at the support end. Yeah? Because what's a coast for everybody else is a push for those students. And what's a push for them is a really, really hard push. Sorry. What is a push for other students a really, really hard push for them. Yeah? And so what you would do is similarly, you would allow your support students to come and negotiate with you as well. Okay? Now, this is really working on the notion of progress, not perfection. What we want to do is to move everybody, no matter where you are on the continuum, over just a little bit. Okay? So that student there gets pushed up here. That student there gets pushed up here. So it doesn't matter where you are. So whether you're a support kid, everybody needs to move along because what can quite often happen is this student here, that B plus A minus student, because they never raise any alarms, they can just coast along. Yeah? So just keep coasting. If it, yeah? So what's a push for everybody else? That's their coast and to a teacher, who isn't assessing properly, they, those students there will remain invisible to them. Same, similarly with, with this student over here. That the teacher may be thinking, oh, this is a really hard exercise, but to these students, it's, it's so easy. 
and they're not growing, they're not learning. So what we need to do is make sure that whether you're a support student, extension student, or the average student, everybody is moving along. No one is allowed to just stay where you are, or worse still, move backwards, okay? So here's an example, or two examples, of where that system has been applied, that three-star system. Now, what you should be able to note is there's quantification. So one star, that's if kids coast, they should be able to do five problems. If they push themselves, they should be able to do seven. Nine problems if they're really pushing themselves. So there's a, there's a maths example. This one down here is a science example. And you can see it's defined by, the and it's quantified by the elements within a table. So here, the, uh, an average kid pushing themselves should be able to do the solid, liquid, gas, plasma rows of the table. What you'll also notice is that sometimes there's just a minimum level of knowledge that students require for an exam, say. So knowing that as a teacher, it would be negligent as a teacher to say to, to the one-star kids, oh, just do solids and liquids. Um, yeah, no, that means there's whole chunks of the, the uh, exam or assessment that they won't be able to do. Where we get around that is this with assistance line that you can read over there in the one star. So by definition, support students are the students in your class who require more support. So while you're the self-selected two star and three stars are working independently of you as a teacher, you are able to provide that assistance, that more um, small group, maybe pairs or individual assistance to the one star students who actually need it most in your class, okay? So this is how you can differentiate your success criteria in a formative way. Now, what's really good about this is that you're actually teaching self-awareness. So that rather than comparing, having students compare themselves to outside people all the time, have the students compare themselves to their, to their prior selves. Have students compare themselves to who they were yesterday or last week or last year even. Because um, constantly comparing yourselves to other people is a recipe for a life of misery. However, if you are constantly just comparing yourself to who you were, then you'll get progress and there's a whole range of benefits which come of that. Now, if you use this method for formative assessment and differentiation of your success criteria, one of the ways that you can use it is that as students are working, um, so every day students are to self-assess using the criteria and they're to draw whether they, they went for one star, two star or three star in the margins. So over the course of a term, you'll have work which has all been self-assessed according to this one star, two star, three star system. Now what's important is that, and what makes this even more student-centered, is that the students are choosing which level they go for. You do not go around the room saying, you're a one-star student, you're a three-star student. No, it's the students who, once they've read the learning objective success criteria and the three-star, they themselves decide whether they are going to go for a one-star, two-star, or three-star. That's gonna make it more student-centered. So at the parent-teacher interview, you've got a whole book of student, of student work which has been self-assessed. It's going to provide excellent, excellent discussion points for you and the, the parent as well. So the, student, so the parents and the students can quite clearly see, oh, they're how they're progressing, how much effort the students are putting into their own class, uh, in, into their own studies, okay? Um, and also with that negotiation that we spoke about earlier, that's another way of building in success. Okay? So it's like the example where if, we, if you had a gym and you had say 50 people come into your gym of all different ages, sizes, abilities, uh, genders who come into your lab, it's not good enough to have a, a gym which just has 100 kilos on a uh, barbell, yep. And everybody, regardless of who you are, has to bench 100 kilos. Now, that's the situation, the metaphorical situation in a lot of classrooms, that doesn't matter who you are as a student, 
everybody is doing this kind of work at this level. Okay? So in a real classroom, in real gyms, you don't just have one weight, you'll have a whole series of weights. So it doesn't matter if you're 80 years old and just started training today or whether you're, you're, you're 25 and you're an Olympian, it doesn't matter. What we do is we differentiate the gym to cater for grandma as well as the Olympic athlete and we should be doing the same thing in our classrooms so that everybody experiences success. So, so grandma who can, who can now lift five kilos on the bar it, and makes progress from not being able to lift anything, you're able to track that progress and actually able to celebrate that success much, much, or so, for much, much more successfully than if you had grandma just trying to bench 100 kilos, okay? Not gonna happen. Excellent, okay? So that's a nice review of how this whole process, this three-star system, is absolutely student-centered. It's the students choosing their targets, they set their own goals, they self-assess, and at the end, they themselves um, d decide upon whether they've achieved that one star, two star, or three star. Okay? So there are your landing objectives again. Just a reminder that this is really the culmination of a whole heap of earlier lectures on cognitive verbs, um, collaborative learning strategies, assessment, really come together in this final lecture. So I highly recommend that if you've forgotten or you haven't summarized or watched those previous lectures, then I recommend that you go back and watch those. Thank you.